Hi guys, back to talk about more simple animals. We have already covered the sponges and the um, cnidarians, and we're two worms now. So the big question, again, kind of following along with your book, are what are the similarities and differences in the three major groups of worms? Worms are defined as long, uh, soft-bodied animals. They have bilateral symmetry. Remember, bilateral symmetry is what you have. So if you were to cut them in half right down between their eyes and straight down to um, the end or the feet, you would have two symmetrical halves. That's what bilateral means. And, and this is a new, um, a new characteristic, worms have cephalization, which means they have a head region and that head region is where their sensory organs are. That's where their nerves are concentrated. For us, that the same is true. We have a brain in our head. We have eyes, ears, uh, nose, all of those sensory organs right in one spot. Worms are the same. Obviously, their sensory organs are less... Um, less uh, specific, less useful than yours maybe in some cases, but, but nevertheless, there they are. Now, the three worm phyla that um, we are comparing are phylum platyhelminthes, and that is this first, um, this first picture over here. Here are the platyhelminthes. The common name for these guys are the flatworms. They um, are typically um, close to microscopic. They are not necessarily worms that um, the majority of them we will see, although a tapeworm is a flatworm, you definitely can see those if they get big enough. But for the most part, these live in water, they are small, um, you'd have to be looking to find them. Um, the picture that I have on this slide is a planaria. Planaria are um, one of the, the smaller worms, but again, they are... Um, you can see them with your naked eye. The second group are phylum nematoda. So right here in the middle, these are the round worms. They, uh, kind of like the name says, they have a round body. They can be anywhere from microscopic to, um, to a foot or more long. This picture is an Ascarius. And notice down there, they have a little coin kind of just as a reference point for you. These are pretty big. They, um, they along with the flatworms, are um, commonly parasitic in some species. They are um, also, with the nematodes, can be microscopic. They're a wide, wide variety, and we're just gonna hit the highlights. And then this last one, it's kind of hidden back there behind my head right now. Those are um, phylum analyta. These are the segmented worms. You are probably right now, if you've been outside at any point in the last few days, going to see a lot of these segmented worms. The common example in this, the picture that I have there is an earthworm. They are, um, just like it says, made of little segments. And if you were to look closely, you could see little lines that divide them into to many, many different segments, depending on the size of uh, each individual worm. Okay, so now, the worm characteristics, so kind of general information. These guys have three germ layers. So this is this is kind of the big thing, three germ layers. You um, also have three germ layers. So they are um, much more sophisticated than what we have talked about so far. They have an epidermis, which is their skin, outer protection. The mesoderm, meso means middle, so this is the middle layer. This is what forms muscles. This is what forms um, the things kind of that give support or that are more, uh, more hard substances within the body. Worms do have muscles, they move, and so they have this mesoderm. And then the gastroderm we've already talked about, that is the digestive and the intestinal system. Worms are animals, so there we have it again. The multicellular eukaryotic cells are the big points there. They are heterotrophic. We will talk about uh, more specifically in a few minutes the parasites. They do have to eat other um, substances. They do not feed themselves. All right, so reproduction also for these guys will kind of go through the highlights. Some of them can reproduce asexually. It's not very common, but it is seen in some of the flukes, which are parasitic worms. It basically just involves the release of a body segment. That body segment contains everything necessary for growth. So genetic material, some proteins, some of the amino acids that are needed. And so they essentially are making copies of themselves. 
Most worms are hermaphroditic, but they do still um, not fertilize themselves. So with the sexual reproduction, it is, uh, can be internal or external. The females can lay the eggs that are then um, uh, fertilized by the male sperm, or they can take the, the, excuse me, the sperm into their body. The females can to be internally fertilized. This has to happen either within the host if they are parasites or within water if they are um, uh, living in water, obviously. And then, of course, in the soil, especially if we're talking about earthworms there. Uh, earthworms lay their eggs in a cocoon. It does take a male and a female to um, to produce the eggs, two different worms, and they form a little cocoon that is underground somewhere. Again, if you're outside uh, any time here um, in the last few days, if you are taking a walk, if you look down on the sidewalk, you're going to see lots of worms, all different shapes and sizes. The baby earthworms are little kind of cute worms and, uh, and they are just now hatching from these cocoons. Now eggs that are hatched in a water environment release a larva. That larva is like kind of uh, a little, um, it's usually thicker in the body. It's not as, as thin as a worm will uh, eventually become, but that larva will develop into the adult. In this form that larva is called a trochophore. Uh, parasitic worms will normally release fertilized eggs in the host feces. When the host goes to the bathroom, those eggs are then um, released out into the environment where they may or may not grow. It kind of depends on uh, where they end up. Now, as far as body systems go, we're getting more advanced. So we're seeing more and more systems and they are, again, very simple compared to what we have, but for what we've talked about so far, they're pretty complex. Worms do have a nervous system. They have two bundles of nerves in their head region called a ganglia that essentially acts as their brain. They are connected to the surface organs on the surface of the, or excuse me, the sensory organs on the surface of the body. That usually for worms is um, the biggest sense that they have is their sense of touch. They can detect light depending on the type of worm that they are. Some of them can detect, uh, excuse me, detect chemicals, but for the most part it is touch. Uh, the respiratory system, so how they breathe, this occurs through their epidermis. They don't have lungs, they don't have gills, so they basically breathe through their skin. Excretory, so getting rid of waste. If it is liquid waste, it just passes out through their skin. If it is solid waste, worms do have an anus and it um, is uh, is solid waste. And some of you have probably seen this. If you've seen like a little hole in the ground, especially in kind of an open area of like dirt with a little hole and there's like a little kind of little piles of dirt next to that, that is the waste of an earthworm as it goes through the, the soil the soil just basically passes right through it. It's eating the dirt and filtering out the, the nutrients from it and the waste comes out the other end. Um, with earthworms, again, if you've ever picked up an earthworm, sometimes they will like squirt out like a yellowish greenish liquid. That's their liquid waste. Um, and they're doing that basically as a defense mechanism. Most of us will drop a worm when it does that to us and that's the point. Um, now, with other worms, flatworms and some of the segmented worms, they have flame cells. And these flame cells uh, are there to remove nitrogen from the soil. Nitrogen is a good mineral for soil. And when the worms do this, they're basically helping um, kind of refertilize the soil. Uh, earthworms are really good for the dirt. And so part of it is because of these flame cells. Roundworms tend to have uh, excretory cells, um, which basically kind of take care of themselves. Uh, circulatory system, this is like blood, heart, um, veins. Segmented worms have a circulatory system. It, it is closed, which means they have vessels, they have veins. Those veins transport the nutrients to the body. They don't necessarily have blood like we do, uh, but again, they do have this system. Flatworms use diffusion to spread the nutrients throughout their body. They do have to eat, and so as they take things into their um, digestive system, it basically just uh, spreads, diffuses through the body from a high concentration to a low concentration. And then roundworms have nutrients that are in the fluids that stay in their body cavities, and that again just kind of is by diffusion. Now, extracellular digestion, this is kind of a big deal. No longer is it each cell kind of doing its own thing. 
now the worm's digestive system breaks down the food before it enters the cell. So that extra on that extracellular, that just means it takes place outside of the cells. And so once it is broken down, then it is carried through the circulatory system into the cells. Tapeworms are an exception, and they are an exception because they don't even have a digestive system. They don't need one because once they are established in a host, they basically just absorb food from that host. All right, now parasitic worms. These are worms that live in or within a host, and they depend on that host for nutrients. Um, so here are some differences between parasitic worms and normal worms. First off, they have fewer sensory organs in adults. This is because they don't need to be looking for food. They are in the host and they're eating what the host eats. So they are no longer trying to go anywhere. They are not trying to find food. Um, no external cilia in adults. Again, this kind of goes back to that first point. They don't need to go anywhere. They're not moving. Uh, they have a very thick tegument. This tegument is uh, almost like a leather coating that they have. Most parasitic worms are living in the intestinal system which means that they are exposed to digestive enzymes, acids, things that um, would basically dissolve them if they didn't have this tegument. And then last, they have suckers or hooks for attaching. This picture that I have over to the side shows what they call the scolix. And it is this head region, basically, that has these attachment, um, attachment parts and um, they're kind of ugly little guys, but that they hook on and then they just kind of hang around in the intestinal system of an animal and eat whatever passes by. Now, some two examples, we're gonna go through two parasitic examples. The flukes are the first one and then we'll get to a tapeworm. But with the flukes, I have um, the example that I'm using is the sheep liver fluke. These live in, kind of says it in the name, the liver of a sheep. So I'm starting kind of at the top as far as the uh, life cycle goes. An adult fluke will produce eggs and those eggs leave the sheep's body in the way. So they poop and the eggs are uh, released out into wherever. Now, if the eggs happen to fall or if the waste actually happens to fall into water and your animals don't care where they poop, so that's gonna happen. Once the eggs are in water, they will hatch and become a ciliated larva. So a little larva covered in cilia, which means they can swim, and they look around to find the body of a snail. The snail is what is called the intermediate host, and this intermediate host is kind of the halfway point for these guys. And this is where the worm will go through several developmental stages. So it burrows into the body of the snail, goes through several stages of growth. Eventually it becomes a tailed larva. So it has a tail now, so it can swim faster and it will leave the body of the snail when the snail is out on land, particularly if it is in grass. And if it does that, it leaves the body of the snail, kind of works its way up on the blade of grass and forms a cyst, tiny, teeny, little, you wouldn't even see it if you were looking for it, little spot on the grass basically and it waits to be eaten and if the sheep or the excuse me the cyst is eaten by a sheep it has now entered what is called the definitive host and this definitive host is where it's going to spend the rest of its life it will eat it will reproduce it will release its eggs this is this is its spot um once the fluke is in to the sheep in this case it will move to the sheep's liver and attach somewhere inside the liver it feeds on the enzymes that are being produced there it feeds on the blood that is filtered through there and all the time it is reproducing it is releasing eggs most parasites remember don't want to kill their hosts that's not the point they don't want to they don't want to get rid of their um, their food source but they definitely will le weaken the host in some way all right, this next is um, just a picture of what we just talked about. So um, goes through all of the steps. I personally like visuals like this, and I think that it might help you a little bit just to kind of see what kind of the stages that it, everything goes through. So know the life cycle of the fluke. It's 
pretty similar to a tapeworm. So now tapeworms are things that people have. So I have a, a pork tapeworm, which is a human parasite. It lives in the small intestines of infected humans. And um, as an adult, it will produce um, little segments of um, itself basically called proglottids. And these proglottids contain thousands of eggs. And it, as the host, as the person goes to the bathroom, if it is solid waste, then one of those proglottids will break off the end of that tapeworm body and it will leave the host in the waste. Now, here's where you need to be thankful for our sewage system, for our, um, for our government, for our FDA, who are, who are kind of in charge of all of this. If that human waste somehow gets into the water source and is untreated, it could eventually end up in the water source for animals. And if it ends up that a pig could take in that proglottid, I have eat on here, but really probably a better word would be drink. Um, and that pig will then become the intermediate host. So the, the tapeworm will spend a little bit of time here, but then it wants to move on. So the pig takes in the proglottid, the eggs hatch in the intestines, and they eventually burrow their way through the pig's muscles and get into a good muscle and they form what are called cysts again. So there's that word again, a little bit different now. Sometimes these are called bladder worms. Now, when you eat meat, you are eating the muscle of uh, the animal. And so if a person takes this pig, slaughters it, and then they eat that pork, they could possibly ingest this cyst. One of the things that our government tells us to do is to cook our meat well. And so if you like to um, eat your meat a little less cooked, if it is undercooked enough, it won't kill, in this case, it won't kill the cyst. It will not kill that tapeworm egg. And you will um, take in the cyst and it would hatch within the human, whoever that is, and now it is in its definitive host. It will go on, it will attach in the small intestine, and the whole thing starts over again. Again, we live in a country that has a very, um, very good sanitation system. We have um, the FDA telling us how to cook our meat. Even if you go to um, go to like a steak restaurant, it will say on the bottom if you like to cut um, get your steaks um, not well done, uh, if you like them a little bit pink, it will say on the menu they are not going to be responsible for any problems that you have from eating undercooked meat. The reason they put that on there is because of these parasites. So cook your meat. Now I have a picture again on this page that shows that same thing. Here's that tapeworm. It's got the, the scolex and then it leaves the intestine, enters the pig, goes back through. I put a little picture on here just kind of for grossness, I guess. This is uh, a tapeworm that has been removed from a person. If you look close enough, you can kind of see the little segments on there. They are annelid, so they do have those segments. Each segment is a proglottid. Okay, almost done with the worms. Now, there are some good things about worms. I know it um, doesn't sound like it after what I've just been talking about, but they do have their good points. So, first off, leeches. Leeches can be used. You've probably heard that people used to be um, used to bleed uh, a person who was ill. You've probably heard that about George Washington. Today, the leeches are used basically to help with skin graft patients. They had they secrete kind of in their like their saliva something that prevents blood clotting. For them, that means they the blood keeps flowing and they keep drinking blood, which is what they do. But in a skin graft patient, if the blood clots too quickly, the blood vessels won't fuse together. And so this blood, this prevention of blood clotting helps um, the skin graft onto the right place and helps the blood flow um, go as it should. Second, this one's a little bit weird, but um, it happens. Parasitic worms can be used to give pain relief to people with chronic immune system problems. Basically what happens is um, if you have an immune system problem, sometimes your immune system is more uh, harmful than helpful. And in this case, the worms can decrease that immune response, which gives some, some comfort, some relief to the people who are dealing with a crazy immune system. 
Um, earthworms are great. They act as decomposers in the soil. They digest decaying materials, other nutrients that um, the plants can't necessarily get to until they're broken down by the earthworms. And the nutrients are then put into the soil because the waste of the earthworms called castings are very rich in nutrients. So that's what I was talking about. Like if you see a little hole in the ground and you see a little pile of dirt next to it, those are the earthworms castings. In the soil, they are very good because they are very rich in nutrients. Lastly, earthworms are also natural aerators, which means that they as they burrow through the soil, as they make passageways and holes, then air can get underneath the ground a little bit. Water can get underneath the ground a little bit. It reaches the roots of the plants. It helps them to, to gather in more water if needed. It also helps them to dry out a little bit so they don't rot. And um, so that's the part that the earthworms play as far as helping the soil itself or helping the structure of the soil. Okay. So that was our next little section of simple animals. Next time we will, I believe, be talking about the mollusks. Thanks, guys. Bye.